So, dear colleagues, dear guests, dear special guests, Professor Adriana, <coughs> welcome to the second symposium of Jan Koyamnik for young scientists at the National Institute of Chemistry. Jan Koyamnik was a former director of the National Institute of Chemistry. He was an excellent scientist and he was also a, person's, a person with many visions, visions in many directions. And one of his special care were young scientists. So therefore, thank you, yes. So therefore, uh, Professor uh, Gregor Andeluch, the director of the National Institute of Chemistry, will now first welcome new generation of young PhD students at our institute. So Thank you very much, Natasha. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to this second symposium of Janko Jarnik. Uh, as Natasha has mentioned, um, we organize this symposia uh, to honor the memory of late Professor Yanni and his care for young scientists. Um, so I'm particularly happy uh, that uh, many of you who started PhDs uh, this October uh, is among us today. Uh, I'm also very happy and I would like to thank to our honorary guest for today's prayer colloquium later on, uh, Professor Ada Yona. Uh, that she was able to come to Ljubljana, that she took her time uh, despite her busy schedule. And I'm really looking forward to spend a couple of hours uh, with you throughout the morning. Uh, so I'm sure Ada will be very pleased to interact uh, with you uh, later on during uh, breaks. Um, so I would like to present a little bit um, our institute. I would like to thank you all, young scientists, for choosing our institute, for choosing our mentors uh, for, as a beginning of your scientific career. Uh, you're making an important first step in uh, becoming a scientist, and uh, we are particularly happy that you choose the uh, National Institute of Chemistry, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, your PhD will be excellent and fruitful as uh, some of the PhDs that uh, will be shown later on uh, during uh, presentations. Uh, our institute is the uh, second biggest research institute from the field of life sciences in Slovenia, uh, but we are the oldest uh, research institute from the field of life sciences. Two years ago we have celebrated 70 years of continued uh, operations uh, we are located uh, in these old buildings which date from 50s and there were some additions uh, added later on during the history. The, the latest and the recent one, this uh, fantastic Gregor Research Center where some of you work, uh, where we placed some of our most precious uh, scientific uh, equipment. Uh, our mission is uh, to expand knowledge of chemistry and related disciplines this second part is more and more abundant, as we will see in later years, so we are becoming really an interdisciplinary institute and our important mission is also to transfer this knowledge to younger generations and uh, to uh, industry. Uh, in 2000, and, uh, at the end of 2007, so at the beginning of this year, there were slightly more than 300 employees. Uh, just to give you an impression what kind of institutions we are, we have 140 researchers with PhDs and uh, between 70 and 80 PhD students every year. So this transfer of knowledge to younger generations is really important to us. We are a young institute in average uh, almost 35 years uh, of age. Uh, and um, we are also proud that we have uh, 10% of foreign researchers who have increased this number and they are coming from 16 uh, different uh, countries. Uh, this uh, um, um, research, uh, this um, research organization is such that there is 11 uh, research departments. Uh, so one uh, is um, actually 10 research departments and one uh, which works uh, exclusively for uh, work for industry. Um, we are particularly sensitive and proud that uh, we are able to 
uh, maintain and acquire uh, fantastic research equipment, uh, some of the most expensive uh, pieces of research equipment ever bought in our uh, country are placed at our institute, for example, this is in the basement of Regal Research Center, I have a STEM microscope for material research. Some of you will work uh, with this uh, machine uh, uh, unlocking secrets of materials uh, at atomic level. So it's really important to have such an infrastructure and maintain it because uh, this then allows the most uh, creative and uh, prosperous environment for your uh, uh, respective research. We also have some other equipment that is listed here. I would like to mention the, our National Animal Center. Uh, this is also very important because it is a member of CERIC network. This is European network of infrastructures and this is actually the only example where Slovenia as a country participates in the network with uh, machines, with apparatuses. Uh, so every month, uh, at least uh, once or twice per month, uh, groups from abroad, from Europe, came to our institute and performed measurements in the animal center. And I'm sure that some of you will also uh, do uh, experiments with uh, personnel in the center. And last but not least, we also are building up a high-performance computing cluster, actually two. And I would like to mention Ashland Computing Center, which is a high-end uh, infrastructure for that purpose. And I'm sure that uh, molecular modeling and associated studies will also be something that you will do during your uh, studies. So, as mentioned, our operations cover many different uh, topics uh, from biotechnology, life sciences research, to energetics, theoretic structural, uh, and structural chemistry, to materials uh, research. With we, we strive for excellence in research because in this way we can contribute to uh, new knowledge, which is our main uh, mission, but also we are helping uh, solving some most precious societal challenges. In this way we are aligned with uh, national strategies, with European strategies, and we provide important um, uh, impacts uh, for health, environmental protection, uh, circular economy, uh, and um, so on. As also, uh, a little bit of this you will then see later on in the presentation of our young colleagues from uh, different uh, departments. Uh, this is an overview of current projects that are uh, running on uh, the National Institute of uh, Chemistry. We are heavily involved uh, with uh, national projects. Uh, the Slovenian Research Agency is uh, important founder, so most of you that joined our institute this year is paid from these sources. But some of you are also paid from European uh, resources. Uh, we have currently 20 uh, Horizon uh, projects. Some of you will work uh, within this project. And I'm very happy to note that this year was very important for us because we have obtained the first uh, um, um, European Research Council grant. Uh, this is um, Europe's most uh, uh, prestigious grant for scientific research and uh, Professor Roman Irala from the Department of Synthetic Biology and Immunology has obtained an advanced grant uh, in the field of life sciences, which is the first time uh, in Slovenia. This is really a major breakthrough because he showed that it is possible to obtain such grants, that it is possible to achieve this level of excellence, and uh, in this way he unlocked the door also for other uh, colleagues, uh, some of you, uh, in the audience, I count on you that you will be the one who will achieve that uh, uh, prestigious uh, uh, grant uh, in the future. Uh, another uh, grant that I would like to highlight and it will give you an idea of uh, what we do uh, at the Institute is grant of Professor Domingo Helis, it's a Horizon project uh, of which Professor Domingo acts as a coordinator. This is very important. Uh, uh, not so many coordinators are uh, placed in EU, EU 13 uh, countries and we are proud that we have some of such coordinators at our uh, institute. Uh, this is a project with 14 partners and almost 8 million euros. You can see that the partners are really established institutions in Europe, Fraunhofer Institute, Max Planck Institute and also some of the biggest uh, automotive uh, uh, industries uh, in Europe. So we are able to coordinate such uh, 
projects and uh, be courageous also in your plans. Uh, it is possible to do uh, these kind of things within our uh, environment. Uh, our mission is also collaboration with industry. So we have important contacts with Slovenian and international industry in uh, uh, in form of services. Uh, as mentioned, there's one that I can uh, just from uh, um, providing services for pharmaceutical and chemical industries. We have joint projects uh, in different European uh, programs, scientific programs, but this is very important. So we have such and development contracts with some of the most important uh, companies. In 2017, we signed contracts with Honda, for example, for the development of uh, batteries. We signed contracts with Janssen for development of vaccine, and we signed contracts with Oxford Nanopore Technologies for development of nanopores. These contracts allowed eight uh, young researchers to do uh, top research, uh, top uh, research that interests industry, but is basic in nature. So this kind of uh, research is something that we also strive uh, in the future, and uh, we would like to have more of such contracts uh, uh, in uh, near future. Um, as a young scientists, uh, I am encouraging you to uh, interact with other uh, young scientists at the institutes, but also uh, between the institutions in Slovenia and abroad. Uh, at the institute we organize two series of lectures, so one series is so-called Forum 40, where young researchers from the institute uh, below age of 40 uh, present their research to other uh, young colleagues. Uh, in this way, uh, we better know what is happening at the institute, but also some uh, networking uh, can occur, also some ideas you can obtain for uh, your respective research. So I encourage you all to come to these uh, lectures and uh, discuss uh, research of your colleagues and your own uh, with them. In this way, your work will definitely uh, improve and uh, be better. Uh, the second lectures are Pregel's Colloquium. We will have one such colloquium today at 12 o'clock. Uh, we try to bring the world's uh, most renowned scientists to speak about uh, top uh, and uh, most actual uh, fields of sciences. Uh, and in this way, we are trying to keep uh, our uh, base and uh, contact with uh, the world's uh, science. I will conclude with this. These are the main goals of our institute for the next five years. We are in the phase of uh, concluding uh, the strategy of National Institute of Chemistry for the period 2019-2023. Uh, we have set up uh, nine uh, goals and we put uh, scientific excellence as goal number one. So I encourage all of you to strive for that excellence and I hope that your PhD thesis uh, will be fruitful, that you will have fun doing your research at the Institute and uh, I wish you all the best and all uh, good luck uh, uh, in the future. With this, I would like to uh, conclude uh, this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice introduction to this symposium. And now I would like to invite uh, Urška Slepšak, the president of Young Academy, to share with us her vision how to become an excellent young scientist. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for my nice introduction. My name is Ushka. Uh, I'm working here. Um, uh, I would like to represent myself a little bit more. Many of you knew me already, uh, many of you don't. Um, I work uh, as a young researcher. Uh, at, at the Slovenian Animal Center, which is located at many places, many offices in the National Institute of Chemistry. Uh, I'm by profession biochemist, working on prime proteins, extraction of bill. Uh, I'm also attending a PhD program, Chemical Scientist, at the Faculty of Chemistry and Chemical Technology, uh, which is working under the University of Ljubljana. But as you are many aware, PhD students are having so many free time. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> no, okay. uh, but I have few and I would like to spend it really 
good and I would like to help uh, and aware all of the society and the policy of Slovenia uh, how our young scientists are doing, um, like to talk about problems, uh, about our well-being. So I attend one meeting at the Society of Young Researchers of Slovenia, which is now named the Young Academy of Slovenia. So I will, I will tell you a little bit more about the Young Academy of Slovenia. Um, in Slovenia, this is Druško Mlad Akademija. Uh, we are a society of doctoral students and early stage career researchers. Uh, we are connecting, educating, informing, um, and representing our members in the Slovenian research and academic field. We are also stand up for fair working criteria, awarding <coughs> and promotion. We are also co-create intergenerational responsible policy um, and society of researcher and in, uh, also in academic field. Uh, but we are also preparing and arranging some social events, some professional meeting gathering. But at the bottom line, we are having really good time joining together, discussing about different topics which are related to young researchers, to postdocs, also to the mentor, supervisor, how to work with each other, which is really important. But how to become successful? This is like the uh, most common topic during our conversation and discussions because there are so many frustrations struggling during the PhD. We have to deal with stress, with a lot of problems, communicate with a lot of people, connect with them, um, and also how to stay motivated during our PhD work. This is like motivational PhD pen or grad, which the well, which correlates and changes during our PhD career or <coughs> early stage researchers. We can divide it into like four phases, which are approximately the same with our time of PhD education. Um, at the beginning, we are super happy, enthusiastic. Um, we would like to know more. Uh, uh, we are like in the phase of Unimportant optimism, but at some level we reach a maximum, and then the velocity of our motivation go into the negative. What happened then? We know our research will a little bit more. We struggle with result or not so good result. We don't know how to implement them. We have to discuss with mentors, supervisors. Maybe we have some problems also with them. And then we realize that we are in the phase of informed pessimism. And this, like in the middle of the second, third year of our PhD, could reach the minimum. Called the valley of shit or <laughs> second year blues. That was cool. So, so we got a little bit lost. Maybe because of this, all these problems, we just sleep around this room <coughs> a little bit. What could happen here is that we struggle too much. We are thinking too much about our problem. We deal too much, and they can eat us alive. We don't want to do that because otherwise we can crush, we can burn. We have to take care about our mental health. It's really important. Um, also. I experienced that I got a little bit out of my motivational curve. I have to spend a little bit on the same place. I have to calm down. I go one step backward, think about everything, to find the strength, to find the motivation, to work hard, to go out of this minimal to reach the phase of informed optimism. Uh, I'm now like in the, the last year of the final step working, writing my PhD thesis. 
but it also is a little bit struggling or frustrating uh, on the almost daily basis. But my goal is to successfully defend, defend my thesis, to be happy, to be helped, to be passionate, and to work even more in science because I love it. Um, but how to become and stay successful in science? There are many skills that we are all need to be aware of. Um, because we would like to be happy, we would like to work, to work good, we would like to be excellent. So just close your eyes, just please close your eyes. Now it's almost all. A little bit. Merry Christmas time. Close your eyes. <laughs> Think about your big chocolate elephant. <laughs> and oh, <coughs> dear to eat it, you dare to try it, you want to try it. But your goal is to eat it all. And this is like almost, almost impossible at the same time. So you have to think how to get to this elephant, which will stay close that this elephant won't crush onto you, not to get frustrated, not to get too, too um, effective about that, <coughs> but to be efficient, to be effective, to be successful. So this is also really important during your PhD work, project management. If you want to eat this elephant whole, it's really good if you divide it into five pieces. Small pieces, eat it bit by bit. And pretty much the same is with PhD. Second question, <coughs> think clear here. Uh, think what you want to know. How you can contribute to the like international sci scientific society. Uh, <coughs> Be organized, be very well organized. Go step by step to reach your goal. Uh, next, practice. A lot of practice and learning. Read about your literature, write about all topic related things, write on your diary, write your reports, write in English. Uh, especially because we are not native speaker in English, we should. So somebody are more good, somebody are less. So we should practice with English, presenting your work, communicate about your work, publish, and also evaluate your work, evaluate your work with your colleagues, and also work, or your work. Um, the other, uh, being humble and open to criticism. Which is, which is important, not to put your ego in front of everything, but something just think, okay, maybe my mentor or supervisor or colleague is right, maybe I should reconsider that, maybe I should take this advice, maybe I should ask, discuss about this advice, maybe I disagree a little bit, but to find some compromise. Uh, Networking is really important. Social networking, professional networking. You never know when you meet somebody at conference and then this person could offer you a job, a positive position, a nice collaboration. Talk with your colleagues, PhD colleagues, positive colleagues about your problems, frustration, trauma. Um, sometimes you will solve the problem with conversation before even it exists or go too big. So uh, connections and networking are really important. Um, one important thing while we are starting with PhD or well, starting to work anywhere is time management. How to be most effective at work, how to find <coughs> balance between uh, professional life and um, social events and private life. Everything is important because we need to take care of uh, our physical conditions, our psychic And also, stepping out of comfort zone. <coughs> you don't want to be ordinary, you want to be extraordinary. Work on that, it's up to you. Um, and 
what is also important, learn as much as possible about being um, a leader, leadership, uh, about foundation, uh, how to get funds, how to deal with it. Uh, I've got some IT skills, how to work with your data, and think about your future. No, think about your future. Because when the deadlines for promotions are close to you, you couldn't do all the work to reach the minimal criteria for promotion. Think about it now. What you would like to do? Stay in academia, stay in research, go to industry. How your PhD can evaluate your work, your uh, further career um, is up to you. Well, this is like basically it. Uh, and now it's time for a little promotion of our society. Uh, we are preparing two events, uh, one in December and one in, at the beginning of the next year. Welcome, welcome, come to this, join us. <laughs>
one of this can be the organic at uh, risk. So we remember from our classes in uh, on faculty that organic synthesis offer many ways to tailor our material with different functional groups and we can synthesize <coughs> at uh, lower temperature the material and also in a green way so with low CO2 and uh, carbon footprint. And of course we can upscale our material. And the beauty of also of the organic batteries is that they can work with different kinds of uh, metal anodes. So they can work with the conventional lithium metal or they can work with other uh, monovalent like uh, potassium or sodium and they can even work with multivalent uh, anions like uh, calcium, magnesium or even aluminum. So why we should now think about different metal anodes? So you, you think that lithium for now is good but each year the price of lithium is increasing and also the lithium is not homogeneously distributed over the world. So we have, we'll have in the future some geopolitical problems like with the petrol industry. So for that we need to strive to search other uh, metal anodes. And one of these uh, metal anodes can be for the future magnesium. So why magnesium? Because it's equally distributed over the world. We will not have these geopolitical problems. So it's abundant. It has much more lower price than lithium. But it comes uh, also with some issue like uh, lower redox potential compared to the lithium one and it has some difficulties to intercalate in the conventional inorganic cathode materials. But with the organic cathodes it's working. <coughs> so if you are now using the two systems, so here we have the same cathode material, the organic one. So the red curve is with the lithium metal, we occupy a high capacity reaching 170 mm per hour per gram. And also we achieve higher cumulative efficiency, it reached 99%. On the other hand, with magnesium, with the same cathode, we achieve quite lower capacity, around 60 mL per hour per gram. And also the cumulative efficiency during cycling is poorer, it's uh, lower than 90%. And also in the initial cycles, we can see that we have a higher uh, cumulative efficiency than 100% that points some side reaction in the battery. So now, we wanted to know what is really happening in these two systems and uh, we wanted to know the issue of both systems. So for that purpose we need some characterization techniques based on spectroscopy. And um, because we have organic cathodes, we choose ER spectroscopy because it's a really powerful technique to probe the functional groups of these materials. But for that purpose, we firstly needed to design a simple cell that allow us a continuously measurement of the ear spectrum and also the electroactivity of our material. So for that, we design a cell with a window that uh, is ear transparent and resistive to corrosion. So we choose a silicon wafer window. Here on this hem, you can see the schematic of the cell. So we have the ATR German crystal. On top, we place it our battery with the silicon vapor window uh, facing the germanium crystal. On the back side, we had our cathode where we probe the reaction mechanism. Then we had the separator that was wetted with the electrolyte. And at the end, we have our metal anode, like lithium or magnesium. And here is the real picture of the cell how it looks like. So here we have the silicon vapor window. So what we can see uh, inside this battery we can see many things. We can see the spectroelectrochemical cell, uh, especially the silicon vapor window here. We can see the electrolyte, because we have it in a huge abundance. We can see the separator, carbon black from the cathode binder, and of course we can see our electroactive uh, organic compound of the product. So in this case, we are probing the carbonyl function of the so here is the proposed reaction mechanism of our organic cathode material, PFS. So it's a carbonyl-based uh, material, so that during the discharge we exchange two electrons and two lithium, and the lithium is coming to the vicinity of the electronegative oxygen. So it means that during the discharge we break the double bond of the carbonyl and we are forming a single bond. And during the charge the reaction should be in the opposite direction. But is this really happening inside? We can tell it by the uh, operando ER measurements. So the blue curve is the discharging of our battery and also in the ER spectra corresponds to the discharge ER spectra. 
and the orange, curve or yellow, is the charging of our battery, and again, uh, also in the air jet spectra and in the charge. <coughs> so what we can see from the air spectra, we can see that we have a main contribution from the silicon vapor window, around 1,107. And we can see the electron. But if we now magnify this region here, where is the carbonyl, we can see a reversible change. So it means that during the discharge, the carbonyl is slowly disappearing, the intensity is slower, and during charging is increasing. But at that point, we wanted to see more, not just the carbonyl, we wanted to see if we are forming some new peaks that are under the electrolyte and under silicon vapor wind. So for that, uh, we use a differential subtraction technique that uh, help us to visualize uh, some small changes in the DR spectra. So how we did it, we took the spectrum <coughs> in point B that is in discharge, and we subtracted the spectrum in point A that it was in the charge or in the initial stage. And we obtained a differential spectrum, uh, the blue one here, and in this case, so it means that if the carbonyl bond is uh, consumed, the intensities should be in uh, negative. And if we are forming some new peaks, the, these new peaks are in positive uh, intensity. For the charging, we just took the spectrum in point C and subtracted the spectrum in point B, and we obtained the differential subtraction spectra uh, in charge. So the peaks now are reversible. What we can see, we can see the reversible of the carbonyl, so it means that the discharge is going in negative and the charge is going in positive. The carbonyl is around 1670 1, and 1650. Then we can see the aromatic uh, CC ring vibration that are changing during the cycle. But mostly what we can see that was before hidden under the electrolyte silicon vapor window, the formation of a new peak here. And this peak is around 1,330 that can correspond to the formation of a carbon-oxygen single bond. But uh, at this point, we also want to see more, not just the end points of the battery, but we want to see some intermediates that are forming inside the plateau or what is really happening during the whole discharge. So for that, we apply our differential structure technique to analyze the whole discharge of the battery and the whole charge. So what we see here is uh, similar like previous. The carbonyl is in the negative, so it means that it's uh, disappearing slowly during the discharge, and then in the charging it's slowly going to the baseline. So it's still here. Then moreover we can see the formation of the carbon oxygen single. But what we can see furthermore we can see the formation of this peak here that is slowly in uh, increasing till the middle of the plateau and then it's slowly disappearing. And at this point what we think that this is a formation of a radical anion during the cycle. So it means that firstly out of the carbonyl we are forming this radical anion and we can see also a little bit shift of the carbon oxygen single bond and then we are forming out of that the just anion. So it means that the carbonyl uh, radical anion is disappearing and slowly you can see the shift in the carbon-oxygen uh, single bond. Then the story uh, with the magnesium is similar, like in a lithium system, so the, you can see the reversible uh, interaction in the carbonyl peak. The intensities here are just a little bit uh, lower because we achieved low capacity, lower capacity. And what we can see again is the formation of a carbon-oxygen single bond that is a little bit shifted in the uh, higher wavelengths. And mostly what we can see during the longer cycle that uh, the structure of the box is somehow different compared to the initial state. Now to prove that we are really uh, sure that we are forming uh, this region, the carbon-oxygen single, uh, single bond, we did a DFT calculation of a frequency of the harmonic frequency of our uh, model compound. So out of our polymer, we choose a trimmer, and we uh, did a calculation in the lithium and magnesium system. And here are just the experimental uh, differential spectra. And what we can see, we can see a really nice uh, uh, following that both spectra are uh, similar. And out of that, we 
can be really sure that this peak belongs to the carbon oxygen single bond. But moreover, what we can see more from DFT is the is the structure of our uh, PQS system. So here is the PQS in the initial state. So when the lithium is coming, it's coming to the vicinity of the oxygen. So the both structures are similar. We don't have some conformational changes. But when the magnesium is coming to the vicinity of the oxygen, we can see that the structure is somehow changing, and the uh, magnesium is bonded to the two oxygen. So this point also why we achieve lower capacity because the diffusion of magnesium is somehow uh, slower in this kind. So just the, uh, to show you, this technique is really powerful because we can probe also a non-carbonyl uh, organic ketos. In this case, we choose polyaniline. In this uh, case, we see the changes between the phenyl and phenyl ring, and we can see the, also the interpolation. In a integration of the electrolyte inside the polymer gas. And at the end, I would like to conclude that we studied uh, different organic cathode materials of this model ERC choice technique, and also that we can apply on different metal organic uh, systems like lithium and magnesium, and we can move also beyond of that to aluminium and calcium. In the future, we will study the degradation of our materials and electrolyte and hopefully also the study the formation of solid electrode interface on the electro surface. And I would like to acknowledge all the co-workers from D10 department, <coughs> especially Professor <coughs> Kabrischek, Elena Spreitzer, Nais Polin, Amanda Roba, who helped us during uh, our work, and also the founding Honda R&D in Germany and Slovenia Research uh, for Foundation. Thank you. Now uh, the lecture is open for discussion. For two, three short questions. Can, can I have one very easy question? <laughs> when we speak about development of batteries, we always speak about changing lithium ion for something else. Yes. But what about this other part, this organic uh, part of batteries? Is there a possibility to improve batteries by designing uh, better uh, organic molecules? Yes, we can improve. Uh, sure. Can we improve? We can improve with design a new organic batteries or cathodes to have a higher capacity. So we wanted to have us in the weight as slow as possible because at the end the mass is important in the battery and we can achieve them. If we have a lower mass of our organic battery and it are working quite good, we can have higher capacity. And we can also strive to have higher voltages. So we need to develop higher voltage cathode material. So for that, for higher voltage, we also need to develop electrolytes that can be suitable for higher voltages. Because now it's a limit till 4.5 or till 5 volts that we can work at that point. The electrolytes that we compose for higher voltages need to also have different electrolytes. Maybe I didn't get it, but I want to ask. Adaptability is something that is very important yes. in, in current batteries. How about the future of the real batteries? The organic material. Organic does not say that it's like plastic. So yeah, but of course, like if you are comparing these two materials with lithium, we saw at the beginning uh, the structure was similar, like under a few cycles. So, but with magnesium we saw that we st still have some conformational changes. Also the, the uh, material is not reacting so much. So it means that just 80% maybe is reacting, 20 no or even less. And of course during uh, such a harsh condition, we wanted not just 100 cycles or 1000, <coughs> the material will degrade it. And so we will have uh, some site reaction will degrade uh, organic material. So for that, we want to see what is really happening to design a future material that should not be degraded so much. No, should be degraded. Should not be. <laughs> not be. It's not degraded, then it contaminates. No, no, uh, that should not be degraded. That 
it's not decomposing yeah, after. The brewers in operation, but later yeah. on it should be. Yeah, yeah. later on uh, you need to strike the recycle. Yeah. You answered about what's going on. Yeah. This, this is fine. Yeah, of course, at the end uh, we wanted to have a recycle of the battery. Yeah. We want to get bread out of it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the beauty of organic uh, materials is, if you are comparing now this technology, it has cobalt that is quite toxic. In organic compounds, at the end, we have just carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. That if we are just okay, burn, uh, it will not be so toxic like cobalt. So the recycle is much more easier.
there were not many methods uh, which can offer us an insight into these structures. And uh, actually, one is very powerful, and uh, this is solid state NMR. And with that method, we were able to somehow determine the distribution of the liquids. And um, so we, we developed an approach and presented it. Uh, so first, we excite nuclei of choice, in this case protons, because they have the most abundant such materials. And afterwards, the polarization diffuses uh, among the neighboring nuclei. This is due to dipole dipole directions, which is uh, through space interaction of the quantum. So, in, and if we uh, choose the right experiment, we can measure how much polarization was transferred among the protons, let's say, uh, magnetically inequivalent protons in this case. And um, the idea is to measure a series of 2D uh, spectra. Uh, with different mixing times, and then we analyze these uh, on diagonal cross peaks and obtain such nice uh, cross spin fusion build up curves. So these curves represent the polarization transfer rate, uh, so uh, we, can, we can actually um, assume that this polarization transfer rate is highly dependent on, uh, on the distribution of the linkers. But uh, this, this was just qualitative measurement, but we wanted to somehow really match the right distribution. So we thought that maybe we could calculate uh, uh, these curves. But this is not so easy, but usually in NMR we often calculate from first principles. But in this case, the, uh, we have many body problem, uh, more than 100 spins needed to be taken into account, which is uh, too demanding for uh, nowadays computers. And uh, we, we somehow um, search for, uh, let's say, phenomenological approach. So we built uh, several models with different distributions, and then use semi-empirical equations, which were already proven in some other case studies, for example, in uh, mass transfer um, diffusion and so on. And so we distances, uh, distances are simply taken from the model. Uh, then we have uh, the starting uh, magnetization, which is derived from the experiment, from the diagonal prospects. And uh, the only missing parameter is parameter A. But this one can be also determined uh, by measuring with the same experimental conditions uh, these proton spin diffusion curves on the reference samples, for example, on a single intermoc. Because for single intermoc, we, we know exactly what is the structure. Okay, and then we apply the same uh, experiment on our mixed linker system, and we can calculate uh, these build-up curves. This, was, uh, this approach was presented through articles, and after that we started to collaborate a lot because uh, other groups contacted us with their problems. And I will just show two very nice uh, case studies. First is study of um, uh, missing linker defects. We wanted to engineer them so to create only missing linker defects in one of the mobs in order to <coughs> create as many as possible uh, active sites. And uh, here the idea was to mix uh, aromatic and aliphatic linkers uh, in, uh, and prepare a mixed linker mob. And because aliphatic linker is not so stable at higher temperature, it decomposes at, uh, let's say, uh, 300 uh, centigrade. And uh, in that way, we create defects. But solid state NMR was crucial here because uh, we wanted to see how are they distributed uh, along the crystals because this is important. You can imagine if uh, one metal center would be surrounded only by aliphatic linkers, we would, after the, the composition, we would lose this center. So, in order to create only um, only um, missing linker defects, we would like to have uh, homogeneous distribution, and this was proven by the solid state NMR here. So we measured again uh, to the spectra and obtained build-up curves and uh, matched uh, the model to the experimental <coughs> data. Um, next, a very interesting uh, case study was uh, actually studying of uh, metal French glasses. Uh, we discovered a new new category of these glasses after uh, outside um, uh, metallic and organic glasses. We now have also metal organic glasses. And uh, this is uh, typical for one subgroup of uh, MOFs, and that, that these are isolated in, in the immune isolated frameworks or ZIFs. Um, they, they are very similar in topology as uh, zeolites, but uh, with this difference, we have instead of silicon oxygen, silicon connectivities, we have zinc uh, 
image rate and zinc connectivities. So the qualities are the same, so LTA, so the light, and so on, so very interesting materials. Um, but in order to prepare glass, we needed somehow to improve the stability because the decomposition temperature is lower than melting temperature. So we needed to mix uh, imiserate linker with uh, dense imiserate linker in order to uh, increase the bond strength between zinc and nitrogen. And so we again have a mixed linker uh, uh, case here. Uh, but I'd like to just mention that uh, using only this volatile linker uh, it wouldn't be okay because in that case uh, the material won't melt. So we really need some mixture. And again, solid state MMR uh, really did a nice job here. It showed us the linkers were well mixed, which confirmed the, the role of the bulky linker. Also, connectivity was preserved, so the slopes were similar uh, in case of interlinker. Um, Polarization transfer. So also we assume that the, the topologically uh, these glasses are very similar to the crystalline counterparts. Uh, but we notice some deformation uh, or bending of these bulky linkers because you see the slope is uh, steeper in case of uh, glass material. So pores were obviously slightly contracted, and this go well with uh, with, uh, with the results of uh, absorption study. So actually, this was the first. Um, uh, glass which was prepared without any post treatment and it was uh, uh, it, it had uh, accessible porosity afterwards and this was actually yesterday published in Nature Communications now at the end I'd like to thank to my colleagues from the Department of Indian Chemistry and Technology especially I'd like to thank to Gregor Mali and Natasha who contributed to this work that I showed today and also to colleagues from uh, Lund University and Cambridge University uh, to the Slovenian NMR Center for uh, Access to Spectrometers, also to Slovenian Research Agency for uh, financial support. And also thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anjaj. So first I, I have to make the correction. I uh, said at the beginning that he published in science. That is not true. But it was only on the one day. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for your talk. And now the lecture is open for discussion. There are some questions? <laughs> oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the nice lecture. Uh, what is, I, I didn't quite get the physical meaning of parameter A, which is a sort of key parameter in, in your equation. Yes. And how, and especially how reliable can you determine it? Because everything only depends on that. Yeah, that, that's correct. It's very important to uh, correctly uh, determine it. But actually, in this parameter A, everything is packed. So uh, <coughs> mostly, let's say, experimental parameters. So uh, NMR experiment, uh, for any kind of experiment, we need to uh, spin the sample, so the spinning frequency is important, and also recapping efficiency. And then the other parameters also, let's say, dynamics of the structure, because you know these linkers are not just static. So everything, so it has to be really uh, uh, fitted on the, let's say, uh, the sample from the same family, so that you have basically same dynamics and with the same experimental <coughs> equipment and with the same conditions. And also, how, how, how well do you do that? That's yeah, I think that's quite well. I mean, um, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was uh, satisfied with it. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have the data. I, I you show you estimate the error just to Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we can estimate and usually we, we put error bars, uh, which are somehow, yeah, here.
Awards and Max Sam's Prize at the uh, Faculty for Chemistry and Technology at the University of Ljubljana. So, Miloša, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so, I am Miloša from the Department of Polymer Chemistry and Technology, and I will present basically some, <coughs> some things that were done during my PhD and uh, how step by step I'm translating this to my current position here. So basically we will be talking, I will be talking about carbines, mesionic carbines with periodic moieties that can act as uh, polydentate or multidentate ligands and those complexes then can be used in catalysis. So just a brief introduction. Mesonic carbines are a subclass of carbines. Um, they can be uh, termed also as abnormal and heterocyclic carbines. Okay, yes, <laughs> here. Um, these are the normal and these are the abnormal carbines. What is the difference between them? The difference is that with abnormal, or let's call them mesonic carbines now, on, uh, we cannot uh, draw a structure without adding any additional charges, which is in fact uh, a good thing because um, uh, with with metals this uh, this is a positive thing because you can uh, you can use them in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, with a lot of traditional met metals and uh, and form uh, stable complexes that are less sensitive to air moisture and oxidative oxidative uh, compounds. Uh, in comparison to, let's say, the known spins or even abnormal carbines. This is attributed to a uh, good and very strong signal donation of this carbonic atom that uh, forms strong bonds with a lot of uh, transition metal complexes, uh, metals. Mostly of the mesonic carbines are from the mesozoium uh, family, that uh, they are also very known in the last decades, but uh, nowadays uh, the triazol uh, family is arising due to their easy access uh, to the copper zido uh, alkene cyclovision. So now I will switch to the, this part of mesonic carbines because I, this was uh, the main thing I think I uh, of my research. Um, they are really excellent in coordination to a variety of uh, position metal complexes and because they, they form really robust complexes, they can be used in a variety of uh, catalysis and which is a good thing is that they are being robust, you can use also harsher conditions with the catalysis, uh, means usually lower catalyst loadings. Um, for their synthesis, it's, it's very important first have the triazolium salts, which are basically the precursors for carbines. The carbines can be isolated as, uh, as long here, but usually you are using triazolium salts and directly form uh, complexes with them. Uh, back in 2013, we designed such type of uh, triazols, which we wanted to translate in the triazolium salts and later on carbines and complexes. The problem was that uh, Using this type of <coughs> compounds uh, and forming and forming triazolium salts, you have to uh, to do the alkylation, which can be a problem if you have a competing group as pyridine. And why we choose pyridine? Because we want to, uh, to have an additional coordination uh, moiety, uh, which pyridine in fact is and is a good one. So basically, we then design a, a simple selective approach. Transforming such pyridine tethered terazolium uh, to terazolium <coughs> uh, using a protection deprotection procedure over the elect sites. Later, we use this, uh, all these uh, ligands to construct a variety of complexes with ruthenium, lithium, osmium, copper, and even palladium. All those complexes were very stable um, in air, also in water. Uh, we did a lot of uh, catalysis in water, for example, except for copper, but this is uh, due to uh, the nature of copper one, which is really unstable if you have oxygen uh, around it, because uh, it goes to copper zero, copper two. Um, 
I will now just show uh, just one topic uh, uh, from the catalysis part, which was transfer catagenation. We, we chose these three uh, series of complexes and did a lot of reductions of, uh, of for example, uh, double bonds, uh, carbonates, imines, uh, nitriles, and also nitro, uh, nitro groups. We obtained excellent uh, conversions and yields using uh, low catalyst loadings and even uh, we were able to do some mechanistic studies. Here is shown uh, predicted, let's say, uh, from the literature what can happen from the, the transfer catagenation of, let's say, reduction of nitrobenzene to aniline. Basically, in the cycle you have two pathways that uh, a metal complex can choose. And, uh, we, we uh, measured the conversion, let's say, of uh, with three different uh, representatives from tinium, iridium, osmium uh, family, and um, we measured with GC and tried to, tried to monitor uh, what are the actual products through the time. With your tinium, we observed that uh, a lot of azoxybenzene is formed, is formed, and this can be then a confirmation that tritinium actually likes more pathway B for the reduction than the pathway F, which was, uh, which was uh, preferred to, for, uh, to iridium and as well osmium-1. Uh, another thing that we did with these uh, complexes was uh, the sonic shear coupling. We constructed this pallad palladium b carbene complex that actually, it's interesting, uh, its nature in solution is uh, a monometallic uh, complex, while in the in the solid form, so in the, in the crystal in the crystals are two complexes uh, with a short distance between the two palladiums. Here we did a lot of uh, couplings with, um, using uh, um, low uh, catalyst loadings, but what was uh, and of course without any additive in water, but what was uh, even more important, we observed that this uh, this catalysis uh, goes to uh, through the two palladium, palladium cycles, which was not uh, seen before. <coughs> At the end, I would like to show you what I'm currently doing. So basically, I moved from the mono uh, the sorry from B detate to tetan detate uh, ligands. Um, so these are mesonic beans constructed with two triazolidines and two uh, pyridines. You can, it can be, of course, cyclic and cyclic, uh, which can be then transformed so the, the triazol to triazol the salts. And later on, uh, the goal is to put them on uh, iron on them. Why iron? Because uh, it's probably the most abundant and uh, more, uh, less expensive. Uh, um, metal in the, in the world, plus uh, it's somehow uh, really uh, pleasant to us and to nature, so basically with, uh, with iron it's really important to have uh, a, let's say a good surrounding, good uh, ligand around it, and uh, what, what is the goal is to achieve this tetra dentate uh, coordination, because uh, with that uh, the iron remains uh, really stable through the whole catalytic cycle when it goes from uh, to the oxidation states. Means that uh, the, oxida the oxidation, the catalysis can proceed smoothly. But on the other side, with the ac acyclic uh, ligands, uh, we want to to put on two or maybe even more uh, irons, uh, iron centers. Uh, because we want to investigate some cooperative effects uh, between the two metals. So basically during the cycle, uh, one iron can then uh, oxidize, oxidize or reduce the other one, which means a better catalysis all in all. Uh, at the end I want uh, to thank first National, Chem uh, National Institute of Chemistry, uh, where I'm currently working. I want to thank also Professor Sack and his group, which I was start, uh, I started collaborating during my PhD and still collaborating with them <coughs> quite a lot. Uh, my former group of Janis Kushmal and of course the Slovenian Research Agency for giving me 
uh, the funding. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. 
and there is no uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So in contrast, in contrast to the current uh, conventional petrochemical process, when you use crude oil and have, you have several steps, and in the end you form a um, lipic acid and uh, um, yes, and, and to, so nitrogen oxides, and uh, also the yields are relatively low. Um, so there are also other um, topics um, that we are working on in other processes, for example, heavy cellulose, valorization to furfural. We optimize the process for industrial uh, company Slovenia, Tanik. Um, then we're working on its further hydrogenation to phosphoryl alcohol, laborinic acid, and um, conversion to gamma malaria. So today, as a case study, I'll present you this laborinic acid um, catalytic hydro treatment to gamma malaria in a three phase reactor. So uh, this is a um, demonstration of a three phase slide reactor. So we have gases hydrogen. Uh, that, so gas and hydrogen is continuously purged through the steered reactor and here we actually have a mixture of uh, or a slurry of gaseous hydrogen in hydrogen bubbles, liquid reactant, the rhythmic acid and the solid catalyst. So because of a certain solubility of hydrogen in, in the liquid medium, um, we, have a, um, we have hydrogen dissolution in the liquid phase so as you could see now, so hydrogen solubility in the liquid phase, uh, then it's transferred to the solid catalyst particle. Um, and then on the catalyst particle, we have dissociation of this molecular hydrogen and its reaction with the bulinic acid uh, in the gamma molecular atom and water. So um, as you can see, it's a quite a complex uh, mechanism. And we are modeling actually this process that you see here. So all the mass transfer kinetics and kinetics on the catalyst surface. And yes, as you can see, you have uh, two, um, two products, gamma level and water. Water was constantly purged out of the reactor with a stream of hydrogen, also with some other, um, other products like CO2. And uh, in the water cool condenser, we separated, so here we separate condensable gases from permanent gases and permanent gases were further analyzed online uh, on, by infrared spectroscopy. So based on the results, so we take the sample, the sample from the, from the reactor, and these are, these are the reactions that we observe. So we observe that the bulimic acid can thermally decompose, so forming CO2 to, uh, to butanol, so this is something we don't like. So this is the first, this thermal decomposition, <coughs> the hydrogenation of uh, hydroxyl group, um, so esterification, cyclization to lactones, or oligomerization of liberating acid. So these are five key um, elementary reactions that can be <coughs> also combined, and, you, and this is how you get the whole reaction factor network. So, and these are actually the products that we observe in our, in our system. And these are the reactions that we actually uh, model in our, in our Model. So this is our desired product, gamma level of tone. Uh, it will be marked as red uh, later on, and these are our, our undesired reactions, so in they're marked with black color. So this is how the microkinetic model was developed. So as already told, uh, we took into account of the thermodynamics, so the uh, hydrogen solubility in the liquid phase, and so on. So and then the mass transfer from gas to solid, from solid to, uh, from gas to liquid, from liquid to solid, then absorption of components on the catalyst, desorption of uh, products, um, reactions in the bulk liquid, and surface reactions. So these are the rates for the mass transfer from gas to liquid, mass uh, rates for mass transfer from liquid to solid, rate of absorption, rate of desorption, uh, the rate of homogeneous reactions and surface reaction rates based on different mechanisms. So when we have all the rates, we can write down the molar balances for each component in every phase, and we get a huge list of differential equations that we saw numerically in, in MATLAB. So this is about, I don't know, 1,000 uh, lines of code, and you press the play, run button, and it works. And this is what you get out. So you get here, the points represent uh, experimental values, lines represent model values. This is for homogeneous reactions. So we have, if we have no catalyst, we only have uh, some. So the rhythmic acid is converted to, undesi to undesired uh, 
CO2, so it actually just thoroughly decomposes. If we increase the temperature, it goes even further, and we have no hydrogenation whatsoever without the catalyst. So this is how we observed, or how we obtained parameters for non catalytic part of reaction. Um, and then if we added a catalyst, so this is without a catalyst, when we were adding 1% or 4% of catalyst, uh, we can see that we have formation of our desired product, gamma valerola form, which is marked as red. And um, of course, this is how we and this is how we obtain kinetic rate constant with given temperature. Then we vary the temperature. At low temperature, we can see that the bulimic acid is very selectively converted into our desired product. And of course, as a chemical engineer, I said, yes, now we have to increase the temperature and it will go in faster. But it doesn't. You can see that at higher temperature, the yield is always the same, while we have formation of other undesired products. And this is why, this is because um, activation energy of our desired reaction is low, while activation energy of our undesired reaction, so the activation energy of undesired reaction is really high. So the increase of temperature will cause uh, that the undesired reaction will be, um, will be increased much faster than our wanted reaction. Of course, high hydrogen pressure increases the temperature as well, model takes that into account, because we have higher solubility of hydrogen in the liquid phase. Um, also, the steering speed, you can see that the low steering speed at 200 revolution, so RPMs, we have some uh, formation of, of desired product, but if we increase it, <coughs> you can see that um, the yield of desired product is getting higher and higher, so we're promoting the electric reaction with, uh, with hydrodynamic conditions, so that means that up to this uh, steering speed, 1000, we are operating in a <coughs> mass transfer limited um, regime, while its further increase of steering speed doesn't have any influence anymore. So here we are operating in kinetic regime, and in only above 1000 revolutions per minute, we can, have, we can have the full use of the activity of this catalyst. So we, we found the reasons why is that so. so we have the, the, the main reason for that is the size of the, of the hydrogen bubbles. So if we have to steer uh, um, so much because we, have, we want to make higher and higher uh, specific surface area of dispersed gaseous bubbles. We also made a validation experiment, so we just, with random set of uh, experimental conditions, we could see that our model still fits the uh, obtained results. This is, this is, these are all kinetic parameters. The most important thing is what we saw is that our desired reaction has low activation energy, um, undesired reaction has high activation energy, and that draws us to the, that brings us to the conclusions that at low temperature we have slow but selective reaction, but above this temperature we have competition between non catalytic that oxidation, which actually over dominates our desired catalytic HDO. This is because activation energy is different, and um, we can of course increase the selectivity with high hydrogen pressure or with more catalyst, while mass transfer doesn't have <coughs> any role as, as long as the um, gas holdup, so the gas distribution of liquid phase is sufficient. This is about, about 800 RPM. So this is another case study I'll just go really briefly through. So eugenol is a model compound of lignin, so it has four functional groups. They can be even clapped, uh, so removed or hydrogenated. This is, uh, these are all the possible com combinations uh, that could take place, but only these were found relevant. So again, we have per nearly perfect thinking of the <coughs> points, and these are the parameters. So why, um, why I want to expose that? Because we have com compared these kinetic parameters with the uh, results of the DFU study, and we could see that in um, the, re the reactant doesn't um, <laughs> interact very well with the copper, for example, but interact very strongly with ruthenium or, or platinum. This is also seen on the X, um, uh, on the, the, this axis. So copper, the uh, energy of absorption is really low, while here for platinum it's really strong. But we see that for ruthenium, this interaction is optimal because we have the highest kinetic rate constant, but the interaction for copper is too, too small, and for platinum it's too, too strong. Um, this is, we could also bridge the gap towards the uh, kinetic Monte Carlo. So not only that we can model the liquid phase, but also what, hap what happens on the catalyst surface. And these um, results can be compared with Monte Carlo simulations. 
So take home message. Yes, we can. We can. So although we are a very young group, so uh, these results were were made by a group where all the members were below the age of 30. So we could develop a deterministic macrokinetic model um, for a very complex reactor. All these phenomena were taken into account. We managed to um, to to understand the influence of time, geometry of the reactor, temperature, pressure, other conditions, and we could in integrate the model with the experimental results and other first principles um, methodologies, so models. So this is applicable for this descript the descriptive um, purposes for understanding what's going on and to forecast what, so and to optimize processes. So this is also flexible for other systems. Systems. So I would like to acknowledge my group, especially uh, Anna, and, Anna and Brigitta, and um, I, I must tell that all these uh, work and results come with a lot of sacrifice. Anna and Brigitta had to sacrifice their modeling career, so photo modeling career. <laughs> now they, they had to work in kinetic modeling. <laughs> so I would also like to acknowledge my funding sources and all of you for your attention. So thank you. No, we, we actually know none, but although I, I, um, although there are many kinetic parameters, I have to point out that each of these case study is based on more than 5,000 experimental points. Okay. So, and, uh, so this is a huge experimental database behind that. So and this is why we, we can be sure that all these characteristic so, processes are relevant. So the model is deterministic, you can yes. have sure. one solution for... Yes. Okay. For example, for this case, we did also experiments with each of these individual intermediate yeah. to get only the rate constant for this reaction, this reaction, and this reaction, this reaction. Yeah. And then at the end, we used the, uh, the reaction itself and all the... Otherwise, you can... Then use. there is only one here. Are you... Uh, Forgetting for one or two reactions somewhere, and then <laughs> <laughs> the mechanism still could be wrong. Then, right? That is that is true, but that, this is why also we have the help of the, our DFT guys who can also tell whether the mechanism itself is, is correct or not. More questions? Yes. For the for the reaction from. From uh, many cases to Gamma on which uh, catalyst you used? Uh, sorry, I didn't mention it. So it was uh, nickel molybdenum on alumina, and this, this is because it's normally this type of catalyst is used in petroleum industry for hydrogen sulfurization, and we used hydrogen oxygenation here. But actually, as you as you saw, this is not the best catalyst because the operation temperature is quite high, and needs to be quite high, and you already have the competition with undesired reaction decarboxylation. So here it makes sense to use more expensive catalysts like ruthenium or noble metals uh, because yeah you then you will lower the temperature and yes and you, you don't get combined the reactions okay. yeah but you 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 will try you try for uh, yeah for ruthenium it works at 170 degrees it's perfect but then it's not interesting for modeling because you have only one product <laughs> <laughs> not challenging. <laughs> The same yeah. question. Okay. Okay. Uh, so maybe I yeah. have one. Uh, there are two other processes you can also use for conversion of sugarcane acid. For example, vapor phase yeah. reaction or maybe photocatalytic. So what do you think? What well, these approaches? Mm, so yeah. yeah. So the boiling point of sugarcane acid is above 200, above 250, I think. So that means that you're already in the region where you have thermal decomposition. So I don't think that, I think it, the better approach is to use very uh, active catalyst at lower temperature than the composition temperature. So I don't believe that the gas phase is, leads to very uh, high selectivities. Um, but for photocatalytic, for, yeah, I, I don't really know. For, for I don't know, you can activate uh, hydrogen with, yeah, you can, yeah, but it's still in a very basic. Okay. 
I, I cannot comment on that because <laughs> I don't know not about it. Thank you very much. Maybe I can ask another yeah. non-scientific. Yes. Partially scientific. <laughs> yes, you can before the all of you. Sorry? You said that all of you are less than 30 years old. Yeah, okay, this works. Yes. Okay. What will be the future? Oh! <laughs> 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 Not very far future, just until the I was at the same question when I got this uh, reward that she mentioned, and I said, yeah, maybe that after five years I want to work in the best. Um, like all of us want to work at the best department, uh, chemical engineering department in Europe. And that will be our department here at the National Institute of Chemistry. What do you do with this very good department? Excellent department. Hopefully, as, as uh, how this, this work as this is actually to, to design a real biorefinery on Slovenian soil. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, complex structures and also to be some support to experimentalists. So basically, we want to get some mechanistical insights into biomolecules, especially there where the, the data is hardly or even inaccessible to current experimental techniques. Um, in the rest of recent years, we've been working on glyphosate uh, hydrolases, studying different experts like uh, designing new ligands or <coughs> hopeful inhibitors, uh, modeling uh, chemical reaction, and the flexibility. Another main field of research is lysosome. Looks like a majestic uh, macromolecular machine. Basically processes the pre-mRNA pre into the uh, exons. And here we study also the splicing steps. We study the cancerogenic mutations, the drug binding, the conformational changes, and probably we'll find something else. We also applied our techniques to uh, membrane systems, especially membrane protein interactions, and um, optimization of um, ribosome inhibitors, particularly short peptides. <coughs> and in the next few minutes, I will concentrate on case studies of uh, glyphosate hydrolases. So, autolysing E, this guy here, is the uh, member of glyphosate hydrolases and is potential antimicrobial target. Why? Uh, gram positive cell wall is um, composed of um, many of peptidoglycan, uh, like, uh, which, uh, which is consisting of uh, glycan chains of alternating um, um, and it's still glucosamine and, and it's still moramic acid, which is crosslinked with peptides. And um, antibiotics, especially penicillin, work on the synthesis of bacterial cell wall. And now we wanted to work also um, on the other part, on the degradation of cell wall. And as, always, as um, the name states, autolyzing uh, degrade, uh, degrade uh, cell wall. And uh, the knockout studies of this and uh, homologous uh, um, enzymes resulted in the abnormal cell clusters and uh, division problems. There are division problems, let's say. So our selected target is autolysis E. The crystal structure is presented here with a modeled uh, glycan chain of uh, substrate. Well modeled. Um, few of these components of glycan were co-crystallized and the, in, the, um, in the yellow color is depicted to uh, the uh, most probable only catalytic residue of glutamate 138. And this is what basically does this enzyme. It just gives the glycosidy bond to the products. So glycan chain to two glycan chains. So in our first endeavor, we try to design novel uh, autolysis inhibitors. We started uh, from the crystal structure with the model substrate and then take the center part of it and extract the pharmacological features. Let's say uh, I forgot to mention pharmacological features are, for instance, H uh, bonds, hydrogen bond donors, hydrogen bond receptors, hydrophobic interactions, and so on. And we use this for Pharmaco 4 modeling virtual screening and molecular docking. We were pleased to obtain um, some ligands in the binding range of small micromolar. Um, the we obtained the class of phenylurido uh, benzamides and also evaluated them in SPR and STD NMR experiments. We also tried to test them on cells but had problems with low solubility. So this would be some um, indications for the future work to increase solubility of this molecule. Um, in conclusion, we designed uh, first non substrate light ligands of autolysing E. And we are now going to the second case study. Uh, we wonder then how autolysing E um, 
catalyzes its substrate. And first of all, we look up in the literature and we find out three most commonly used mechanisms by the glycosid hydrolysis. The first one, there are two uh, catalytic amino acid residues. Usually they are uh, glutamate and aspartate, one acting as a base, another one is uh, <coughs> the second mechanism. Um, there is uh, water in between and the, uh, the sterile chemistry of the products is inverted. And in the third mechanism, there is only one catalytic residue and uh, substrate, uh, substrate scars um, at this reaction. So our question was, uh, which, of, uh, which one of uh, three would most likely describe the catalytic reaction of um, autolyzing it? <coughs> so first of all, we did mutational studies. We tried to pick up residues from the structural data uh, we, we have. And uh, we have um, chosen mainly um, aspartates and uh, glutamates in the vicinity of the substrate and also some other residues which we thought were important for the substrate binding. And, uh, and then we have uh, subjected them to the site-directed uh, mutagenesis. We find out that only glutamate is the 100% is the catalytic residue. And also we found that out that other catalytic residues uh, diminish the activity of the enzyme. Um, uh, mutations of other catalytic residues uh, diminish the uh, catalytic activity of the enzyme. And we weren't really sure if this is because of their direct role in catalysis or their role in substrate binding. So we did also molecular dynamic simulation. And besides finding which residue interacts with uh, substrate, and how often and how often these interactions. I think that the red ones are uh, H-bond donors and blue ones are H-bond acceptors. We also observed uh, state one, where the catalytic glutamate is in the vicinity of um, sisal glycosidic bond, and state two, where the catalytic uh, glutamate is a bit further away and water molecule comes in between. And the both states are roughly equally distributed during the simulation period. And what we found out was also that the second catalytic residue, uh, uh, aspartate, was, which is not depicted here, uh, was pointing away from the substrate. So we um, excluded it from the, from the subsequent uh, QMN studies. So based on the mutational studies and molecular dynamics, we designed two reaction pathways. Um, it would be if you really try to focus um, described also here. So the first um, catalytic pathway, PET A, uh, features direct proton transfer from glutamate to uh, glycosate. And the second uh, path features the water transfer mechanism, so so-called water assisted mechanism, directly from water molecule to glycosate bond. And we also uh, wondered which one is the transition state of the two. So that oxazolinium ion would mean that our, uh, our reaction is um, substrate assisted. And we, we tested the transition state with uh, the QMM method, which I will uh, explain in a moment. And we find out that oxacarbenium ion is most likely a description of transition state, as the oxazolinium ion has much higher energy. So, it, um, so as a reactant, we said the oxazolinium ion, it converted to oxacarbenium ion, and then it went to products. So for the, for the final judgment, which reaction is most um, probable one? We employed uh, quantum mechanical, molecular mechanical uh, method. For these, there are many methods, and we have chosen a replica path method. Um, as this method doesn't require a predefined reaction pathway, and in this way, it's less biased than other methods. And we obtained two energy profiles, and uh, based on the height of uh, reaction barrier, 
we concluded that um, reaction uh, um, reaction B. So that uh, so water assisted mechanism is um, is probably the way in which the catalysis of autolyzing goes. So this water assisted catalytic uh, catalyt uh, mechanism hasn't been yet described in the literature. So it has yet to be experimentally evaluated if our models are right or not. Um, I would conclude my talk here and I would like to thank the DO, theory department, um, ex uh, colleagues experimentalists from Julius Stefan Institute and the group of my uh, postdoc supervisor um, in Italy. And last but not least, <coughs> from our <coughs> Designed to bind any selected DNA sequence, 
This would enable us to control basically anything we want. Transcription activator like effectors, or in short, tails, are really interesting proteins. They were first found in bacteria that infect plants, and in 2009, scientists deciphered their DNA recognition code, or in other words, they deciphered the mechanism with which they recognize single nucleotides on the DNA. And they found that these tail proteins can actually be designed to bind virtually any DNA sequence. So I've been working on these tail proteins for quite a while now, uh, <coughs> and during my PhD, we use them mainly for construction of logic circuits in mammalian cells. But today I would like to talk about our most recent uh, discovery, which was published just last week in Nature Chemical Biology. So as I already mentioned, those are, um, at least for me, quite interesting proteins, and they have a very unique way of binding the DNA. As you can see it, um, in the image here, they, they, they like wind around the DNA like a spring, uh, which is uh, already quite unique. But to me, what is more interesting is uh, the way that uh, they, they actually um, come to this winding. So, they are composed essentially of two parts. So one is the big one here, the, the, in the green, the central repeat domain, which is responsible for binding to a specific DNA sequence. And then we have this small part here, which is the N terminus, and this part acts as the binding anchor. So initially the protein binds with this small part, and then the rest of the protein binds to the DNA. It's shown that if you remove only this small part of the protein, it doesn't bind to the DNA at all. So this N-terminal part is actually very, very important for initial binding of the protein. So as I already mentioned first, it binds with the left part, the N-terminus, <coughs> and the rest of the protein binds. And if you add an activation domain to such a, a, a protein, we get a, a very specific activator which can turn uh, any gene we pick on. So, because of this unique binding mechanism we have, we wonder what would happen if we had two adjacent sequential tail binding cells. And as you can see here from, from the model, we expect some steric overlap in this part here, which is marked in red. And this steric overlap is basically exactly the place where the end terminus of the right tail should bind to the DNA. So, what we figured, what we figured out, what we actually proved, uh, was that this happens. So if you add the left tail, it can bind to its target site and displace the right tail from the DNA. So th this is actually uh, a new way of transcriptional inhibition. Um, and we've also shown that it only works in one direction. So the right tail can displace the left one and the left one can displace the right one. We compared this mechanism of transcriptional inhibition with other mechanisms that are most commonly used in synthetic biology, and we've shown that our mechanism is much, much more efficient than any other mechanism uh, tested, so this is a really good thing. So we went even one step further. Uh, we added a third tail to this chain. So what happens here is that the third tail uh, displaces the second one, and in turn the first one can rebind to its binding site, which turns the gene on. Uh, we uh, added the fourth one to the reaction, which should now turn the gene off. And we've shown that it works even for a chain of five adjacent uh, tail proteins. So uh, this again turns the gene on. It's kind of like the dominant effect, only the every second tail falls down. Um, so we re realized that we can use this chain displacement mechanism for construction of complex logic functions in the main themselves. Um, for example, we did all possible to input free and logic functions, which I won't go too much into the details. You can check out the paper or you can talk to me after uh, this lecture. Which is, of course, this, this, such engineered cells would be useful in medical therapy and biotechnology with increased precision, safety, and efficiency. Uh, next, we wanted to know if tails can also displace other proteins from the DNA, not only each other. Uh, so I'm sure that at least some of you have probably heard of the CRISPR technology. 
which is one of the most important and um, promising technologies for genome editing uh, or genome engineering, other words. Uh, but it has one huge downside, so it can also create unwanted targets, uh, which is not really safe if you want to do gene therapy on living things. Uh, and we found that the tails are um, able to displace the CRISPR uh, complex on the DNA, and this is a, this is a way with, with, with which we can protect unwanted targets and could, of course, in the future be used for, for a safer and more reliable gene therapy. So with this, I would just like to briefly, uh, briefly thank everyone who contributed to this work. Uh, the whole department of synthetic biology and immunology, especially Andrzej and Ayasia, who are co-authors of the paper, and of course, Dr. Roman Yerala, who led the research. And thank you all for your attention, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to ask. Molecular evolution 
of small beta structures proteins that uh, specifically bind to various cell membrane components. Uh, so uh, she also received the L'Oreal Foundation and UNESCO uh, Prize for Women in Science. And uh, she published actually only one paper, but that one was published in science. Thank you. Uh, welcome to this mini symposium. I hope I won't be the one that uh, is standing in the way of your coffee break for too long. So uh, again, my name is Thea, and I come from the Department of Molecular Biology and Nanobiotechnology. And today I'm going to talk about understanding of NLP client membrane interaction. So first of all, uh, toxins are uh, biological instruments that are used by various organisms to prevail in a hostile environment. And a special class of toxins <coughs> are several pore forming toxins that actually protrude through plant membranes and cause cell death at the end. Uh, we mostly focus on single domain beta sandwiches uh, that are, in fact, taxonomically unrelated. So they have similar structure that is a beta sandwich, they all have membrane binding ability but they are coming from different organisms. So they use the same uh, mechanism. So these are a couple of these families. You can see from the lectins, actinoporins, thermostable, uh, direct analyzes, degrelizes, and analyzing proteins. These do not bind to membranes. You can see here in this uh, classification or through the comparison of uh, the different family, uh, protein families, that some of them have bind to sugar residue, to sugars, to sugar components of membranes, and other bind to lipids. Now, this family of NLP proteins is very tricky because we didn't know at the beginning uh, to which kind of uh, molecule did this protein bind. So we were focused on NLP proteins the most during our research. So NLP proteins are a protein family that cause cell death in dicot plants. And they're secreted by several plant-associated microorganisms, and they function as plant uh, membrane disintegrating. Um, so they can be very dangerous because of the economic loss that is caused by the damages these infections uh, do. There are also some non-toxic representatives, and I will talk about them as well today. So, the thing is that NLPs bind to the membrane and we were very happy to identify this specific molecule from the plant membrane, which, is, which are glycosinostal phosphorus ceramides. These are abundant class of sphingolipids in plants and can be very diverse in terms of their structure. They, have, they all have this phosphoceramide core to which a different number of sugar is attached. And in general, in dicot uh, plants, only this kind of predominantly this kind of GIPC, so we don't need three sugar attached to the phosphoceramidic core, while in monocots, uh, additional number of sugars are attached to this uh, GIPC. Uh, we also found that the NLP proteins attached to the final uh, sugar residues, uh, so there is some sort of affinity, and we use that knowledge to prepare uh, complex structures. So in white is the structure of the structure of apple form NLP protein, and in pink there is a complex structure. So we see there is a this is a superposition of the two structure, and we see there is in fact some structural changes that occur upon the sugar binding. And the first one is the coordination shift. So in the beginning, this magnesium ion is coordinated by this set of amino acid residues, while in the complex structure, this this uh, magnesium ion gets pushed towards the interior of the protein and gets coordinated with a different set of amino acid residues. Now this histidine one-on-one -on -one that is previously engaged in this coordination indirectly is now free of coordination in the complex structure because it is in fact uh, involved in the binding of the sugar together with this aspartate residues. Interestingly, in 2009, when the first structure was discovered, they performed some mutagenesis analysis of these residues that are involved in magnesium binding. But now we identify the new amino acid residues that we see is actually involved in the sugar binding. So we performed some mutagenesis analysis of this particular residue. 
So interestingly, this is the this is necrosis that the Wata protein causes on the tobacco leaves. <coughs> but when we changed, when we mutated this aspartate to alanine, which is a smaller residue, there was still necrosis. But when we changed this residue to a bulkier, to a bigger amino acid residue, we saw that we um, decreased the toxic ability of the proteins. Meaning that if there is a bigger residue in that place, the sugar cannot bind anymore, the sugar part is, uh, the binding of the sugar head group is blocked by the bigger uh, residue here. Now st structural changes can be very well seen here in the surface presentation. So this is the structure before the glucose comes in and here is after the binding of the glucose. And you can see that there's actually the opening of the crevice in order to recruit the GIPC head group. We also found here that another structural change is this, this location, and there is a tryptophan residue, which is very important in pore forming toxins in order for proteins to anchor in the membranes. So, this MLP protein family also contains a tryptophan residue to do that, and when we, evolve, when we change this tryptophan to alanine, we of course totally abolish the product activity. Uh, so now this is the model, so the protein specifically recognizes GIPCs found in uh, predominantly Uticots uh, and several conformational changes occur in order to uh, <coughs> embrace GIPC head group. Now, interestingly, NLPs also bind to the monocot GIPCs that are bigger but there is probably this distance of the NLP protein from the membrane that inhibits the further membrane disruption. Um, we will also very interesting to see how non-toxic representatives act and what are the main differences between toxic and non-toxic proteins. And we were working with this HANLP3 protein which is very similar in terms of uh, amino acid Sequence. So we uh, characterized this protein and we determined its uh, three-dimensional structure and we saw two differences that strike this right from the beginning. The first one is this HNLP3, the non-toxic NLP, is glycosylated and has three glycosylation sites. So we said, okay, maybe this glycosylation, because it has some arms, uh, can inhibit the binding to the membrane of these proteins and, uh, and then at the end, of course, uh, toxicity. Uh, so we cut those sugars <coughs> off and we infiltrated them, we tested them for necrotic activity and there was no effect. And the second thing that we observed in this structure is that HNLP3 do, doesn't have a metal ion in the structure and we saw before that this metal ion <coughs> is very important for the toxicity. So we also incubated the proteins with uh, different divalent uh, ions and we saw that there is no effect again in terms of toxicity. We then checked this, uh, the close-up view of the active site, active site that I showed before and we see that HNLP3 has every amino acid residues or almost every amino acid residues uh, than uh, toxic ones. So what is then the difference between toxic and non-toxic? We established what is causing the toxicity in the toxic ones. So we had to check other parts of the protein as well and we found out that if we change, if we put some non-toxic amino acid residues to the toxic scaffold, so we perform the genesis analysis again, we saw that there is some effect on the toxicity of the toxic ones with non-toxic residues. If these residues are in L2 domain, L3, L3, L2 loop, L3 loop, and this LC loop, which is the loop covering the active site. So we next checked also the surfaces, and you can see in the non-toxic uh, protein that this cavity, the active site, is actually in a more closed state than it is in the toxic which is more open and also the electrostatics of this area is quite different. This LC1, L2 and L3 loops are very hydrophobic which may, uh, this is the, uh, just the detailed analysis of the mean acid residues in this area, uh, and this may in fact 
cause rigidity in the non-toxic protein. And this was also confirmed by this molecular modeling where we can see that the loops here at the bottom of the molecule are far more rigid than the loops here from the toxic protein. And now for the second part of our uh, experiment, we chose to put these areas, so LC1, L2, and L3, from the toxic to non-toxic scaffold. Okay, and we did in fact um, cause proteins to exert toxicity towards plant cells. So this area, this plasticity of the loops is in fact very important for uh, protein toxicity. Again, if we go to our uh, model from before, you can see the non-toxic NLP has uh, structural features that inhibit the binding, such as the smaller cavity and the rigidity of this side of the protein and cannot effectively bind GI piece sugar head group. While when we used uh, some of the plastic regions from the toxic one and incorporated them in the uh, non-toxic the scaffold, we saw that there is a binding to GIPC head. So with this, I would like to conclude. Uh, so we provided structural basis for NLP plant membrane interaction. <laughs> we explained why only dicot plants are sensitive for these proteins. Uh, this is, of course, uh, very good for phytopharmaceutical development in the future, as I said, because of the loss of crops and economic losses because of the uh, all fields get killed. Um, and of course, we provided also the basis for fine tuning of NLP toxicity that is in the protein flexibility, which is a unique trait in cytomatic NLPs. And now I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't too long. Um, of course, my two mentors, Gregor and Marietka, the NLP group in our department, the whole department, which are, which are very nice and the rest of our collaborators as well. So thank you. Thank you very much for a nice lecture. So now the lecture is open for discussion. There are a lot of chemists here. So questions? Yeah. <laughs>